So, hello and welcome to the 7th Annual Hackers Congress Paranipolis. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, everyone here who is in the studio and also out there, thanks for tu tuning in. Uh, today, for the first talk of the conference, we're going to have Sara Pollock, who is going to talk about, uh, she's an archaeologist in, now in AI, and she today is going to talk about um, the role of AI and technology uh, in the creation and challenging of the state. So please welcome Sara Pollock. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for a warm welcome. Hello, everyone that you're watching online streaming. It's great to have this hybrid model. Um, I'm uh, really, really honored to be here. Um, Paralonipolis is something that I've been involved in relatively recently, but something that I've actually all my life believed in without realizing that there's actually a physical space that represents that in Prague. So I'm thrilled to be a part of this and thrilled to be speaking at this, at this conference. Um, originally, I'm an archaeologist and cognitive evolutionary anthropologist um, who got sick of academia because it took too long and not much was moving, and it was a really kind of... A weird system that didn't really suit me. So I went into startups, I went into tech, and I sp I've spent there probably like the last eight years in various startups, uh, whether they were based in New Zealand, Los Angeles, or London, um, where I lived almost 10 years, hence the stupid accent. I picked that up from Monty Python, pretty much. Um, what I'll be talking about today is um, actually bridging that gap between um, AI um, and archaeology, because right now the way that we view technology is through a very narrow lens, like we've got our phones, we hear artificial intelligence being spoken about all the time, but actually if we look at the long vista of human history, there's a lot of other inventions like writing, fire, stone tools, that created a huge social revolution, um, and I think that we need to view the technological world that we live in now through a similar lens. So what I'm going to to try and do um, is bridge that gap today um, and also show you how uh, traditionally technologies have been used to both challenge but also uphold the state. So today's agenda, um, by, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm just going to close the door because as, mu as much as I love popular music, I, I'll get thrown off. Uh, I'm like an 80-year-old man in a 20-something-year-old body. Um, there we go. Right, so today's agenda. We'll be talking about historical technologies because technology does not just equal algorithms and like your latest MacBook. Um, we're also going to be talking about my personal story. So I've started working um, in the tech now giant, soon to go public, um, Palantir, which is an interesting company of its own. And then I like through various vistas, I ended up actually building the digital infrastructure um, on both sides of Brexit, amongst other things. So a completely, I'm completely apolitical, like politics does not interest me at all because I think it's all the same garbage. <laughs> but um, um, it was really interesting, like being able to compare like the left and the right sides of the spectrum, and I'll be sharing some of my lessons from that. Um, I'll also be busting some myths about AI, because AI is definitely not what it actually is portrayed by the, the media, um, and I'll be talking about that a little bit in more detail. And finally, my predictions of the future. I mean, it's not like anyone's interested. I'm literally just like some random archaeologist thinking, oh my god, what's going to happen in 50 years? But I think it's important to be talking about that, because our society goes through certain cycles, and we're at a, at a breaking point, where traditionally I think that there would have been a revolution. We're not necessarily going to have an outward revolution as we have had in the past, but um, there is that tension building, and I think it's curious to think about what's going to happen in the next few decades. So just to have some key um, definitions for today, because um, that's always important to coin down. First of all, what the state is. So state isn't political parties. Um, the state isn't um, something that you see like drawn on an organizational map. The state is intrinsically linked with the way that humans um, have evolved and the way that humans, uh, human societies have evolved throughout the ages. So even tribes uh, of um, like uh, prehistoric people um, that have been organizing themselves had some kind of state. So for example, the Kalahari Bushmen um, of Sub-Saharan Africa and the various tribes like the Azandi and the Nua that live there have in incredibly intrinsic exchange mechanisms, for example, for cattle. Or they um, have a very like artificial almost system of communism where if a hunter comes from a successful hunt and the, hu the other hunter has not been successful and say the other hunter brings like this massive kudu that they've killed as going to feed the entire village, they actually go through these really elaborate rituals where they play down what 
they've achieved so that the other hunter won't get offended and they share everything and they take like the worst part of the carcass but it's an incredibly artificial system of rituals because if they didn't have that like a hierarchy would suddenly build up really quickly and they would all murder each other so um it's really important not to think of the state as just like some 1984 concept but something that is intrinsically linked in the very complex human creatures minds Technology, again, um, I've already mentioned this, I don't want us to view it only as like sets of electronics or algorithms. Technology can be writing, like technology can be the printing press, it can be the steam engine. Basically an innovation that is scaled and that rapidly changes the way that we perceive um, the, the world around us. Artificial intelligence. Now, <laughs> that's a difficult one to coin, and I'm sure that there'll be someone who will disagree with me, which is completely fine, because that's what these things are for. Um, I actually don't think that we should be using the term artificial intelligence, because it implies something that's equal to a human brain, or basically like the human brain only like replicated in some kind of artificial setting, or like some kind of like robot terminator that can do, do its own stuff and think of its own. It's not that. It's glorified statistics, the way that we have it now, and very like sophisticated and an amazing um, analytical models that can work very, very quickly with huge chunks of data, but they're not thinking of their own. Like, I, I saw this um, thing the other day where they said, oh, there were these two chatbots talking to each other and they invented a new secret language and they had to be switched off. No, they didn't. The, the, like, the programmer was shit, right? And, like, they suddenly started talking in a pattern that someone didn't understand and they switched it off because it was embarrassing. Like, that, that's it. Um, artificial general intelligence. I've got several friends who are fantastic. Um, scientists in this regard um, who are working on that research, we're decades away from that if we're being optimistic, um, and we might never even get there. So it's a really long way off, and seeing artificial intelligence as like this omniscient creator of fake news, etc., is just, th that's not what it is. Think of it as efficient and effective statistical models. Society and culture, again, like, I, I took, I chose really easy things to define, didn't I? That's, that's awesome. I'll get stuck on this slide. I knew I would. Um, society and culture, again, it's a very transient thing. So humans have this um, propensity to see the world around them as status quo. So, oh, we live in nation states. Oh, we live in the Czech Republic. That's always been there. Oh, there's Germany. That's always been there. It really hasn't. Like, Germany was unified under Bismarck, which is pretty recent. Czech Republic is, what, like 30 years old? Um, like, we live in a really new system, um, and we're being forced to adopt it as status quo. And that's just not the case at all. We're also forced to adopt like an almost evolutionary di directional view of society. So like you go from, I don't know, a tribe into like eventually an empire and then you're, you're the enlightened republic. Again, no, like the Roman Empire started off as a republic and then switched into an empire. You had Akhenaten in ancient Egypt who literally within the span of a generation took a huge polytheistic where they believed in like say 50 different gods to one god to 50 different gods, all in the span of a generation. So humans tend to experiment with social structures, and that's completely fine, but we shouldn't be afraid to do that. And we're being put in a situation where that experimentation is massively discouraged, because obviously it would cost a lot for some people not to have it that way. So the historical abuse of technology. Um, there's a couple of uh, technologies that I really want to point out um, uh, that, it, again, doesn't have to be an algorithm to, to be abused. So writing, industrial revolution, wars and weaponry, opium and spices and like other very rare things and the control of that trade. Um, a control of transportation and infrastructure, radio and film, and even the concept of borders. All of those, they might not seem like technologies to start off with, but they're all used as uh, and spoken about the way that artificial intelligence, for example, is spoken about now. And I'll go into a little bit more detail into all of them. So writing, you had the invention of writing roughly three and a half thousand years BC. Um, obviously, the Egyptologists and Mesopotamian specialists um, massively argue about that. But the effect that it had was not that he had writing. Suddenly he had an elite group of people that um, were teaching how to do hieroglyphs, because not every Egyptian peasant could do this, obviously. That created a new educational system. It created a new pharaonic system. It led to the unification of Egypt. Like, th there were really big social changes that happened with that. When the printing press came in, everything changed dramatically again because suddenly writing wasn't just something that a few monks or a few scribes can do like the regular population suddenly started being exposed to like literacy and like uh, pieces of work could be replicated books could be printed the bible got translated from latin into english which by the way was one of the biggest like social wars of um of the l last millennium probably and it led to a huge divide in europe where you've got like 
countries with a Protestant um, tradition and countries with a Catholic tradition, and it ca caused civil wars, like for example in the UK or Britain. Um, so all of these had huge connotations, and they were all used to control the public. Remember, you used to go to mass and listen to two hours of Latin, not understanding a single word of what was being said. And then they came out of church and they were like, yeah, yeah, that was really interesting. Was it? Like, you literally just don't know, know what was being said. And then suddenly these things started being in English, and people started challenging them, and that's where a huge um, clashes started happening. And I think it's similar to what we're seeing now. Alphabets, again, um, encrypting this knowledge. Um, I'm quarter Vietnamese, and um, one of the things that the French did um, when they um, invaded Indochina and when they kind of colonized um, what is now Vietnam, um, they changed their traditional uh, script into uh, the Latin alphabet. They still couldn't understand a word of Vietnamese. They didn't speak Vietnamese, for, but for them, it was culturally much more digestible. So again, you see this play with the ways of ex means of expression. Um, Mao, for example, in China, he tried to actually ch do the same to the Chinese script, but there, because Chinese is so connected to Confucian uh, philosophy, he actually found out that despite the disgusting dictator that he was, he was actually unable to push culture that far people were holding on to that so it's really interesting to just observe like zoom out and see what has happening been happening through history and obviously cryptic messages things like enigma fighting wars where writing was absolutely key and often like the turning point in a very bloody conflict um it just shows the huge power of this invention uh, the industrial revolutions that have happened, from the steam engine to electricity, like the adoption of electricity was basically a political coup. Like the whole AC versus DC um, current wars, um, it was the whole Columbia ex Exposition, um, it was the World Fair, um, all that was about that people wanted to get like the state money to be the one, like the Edison versus the Westinghouse company, to be able to provide their type of current. Again, it wasn't a technological war, it was a political war. Um, and we can see all these inventions being politicized. Um, the same with steel production, mining, um, all the tolls that various countries have placed on each other, the splendid isolationism of Britain and when it came to trade, the same that, that happened to America at the start of the 20th century. You can see these things being massively manipulated. And of course, then from them come the social theories. So Marx and Engels, they actually started working um, with the new rising um, working class in the UK, where you again started to have this friction of like five-year-old kids working in mines but at the same time, like they had to be educated and like they couldn't do both. Um, and it, like I've lived in the UK for almost 10 years and the level of social stratification that is still um, a result of the Industrial Revolution, the differences in accent, depending on what class you come from, the differences in education, the differences in where you go to university, what you're called, like if you're called Hugo, automatically, boom, done, upper middle class, finished. Like it's really, really interesting anthropologically, like how these technologies, like what a professor found effect they've had um, on societies for centuries. War and weaponry, um, again, this is uh, hugely interesting, not just for the sake of technological innovation, but also for the social change that this usually precipitates. The reason I put Napoleon there is because actually the Napoleonic Wars were fascinating when it came to um, setting up income tax in the UK. So before the Napoleonic Wars, the UK, obviously a lot of colonies, very happy, all awesome. And then they realized that they're running out of money because Napoleon was very difficult to beat and that cost a lot of cash. Um, so they imposed a very stratified and very um, systematic income tax on the population. But again, like we see income tax as something, oh, well, that's always been there. No, it hasn't. It's really been there for like 200 years. And the reason is that you couldn't really afford to pay for wars anymore. So, um, and th this then followed with various things like the gold standard, um, where the monetary system and the way that, that the money is being extracted and like transacted between the society and the state has been really artificial. Um, and it, it has been dictated often by singular events that have happened. Um, it, of course, also led to centralized organization, redrawing of borders. And my subject, archaeology, anthropology, um, people like Radcliffe Brown and Foucault and um, Levi Strauss, they all started suddenly seeing society as something to be scientifically analyzed. So you had structuralism, functionalism, like all these ideals of how society should function. 
they're all pretty much bullshit, but um, they're interesting to t think about, and like there, there are some interesting parallels to be drawn from them. But like for the last 100 years or so, what we've been almost seeing is like e eugenics on the society, um, where like the ideal society and the, the ideal way b how the transactions should happen between the people and the state have been analyzed in a really like scientific, like Darwinistic way. And it's getting to a stage where people are realizing that that doesn't actually work, that people need individual freedoms, and that that's not being catered for in this massive diagram. So uh, I'll get more uh, to that um, in a little bit, but it's just interesting to think about. Trade, I mean, the opium wars, they, they were uh, fun, um, to say, say the least. Um, again, it's just the control of uh, like precious materials. Again, like the technology that goes with that, the building of roads, the um, scaling of your navy, the, the scaling of your army, the scaling of your transportation system, like all of that. Um, it, like even just uh, Wells and Fargo, which is the um, still functioning, like, ancient DHL of, of uh, United States of America. Um, uh, that was basically a very intricate uh, web network that was used for trade and to deliver post. And it, it seems stupid, but actually technologically, that is a really interesting thing to bear in mind again. Um, so, oh, there you go. I pasted my name three times there. I look like an egocentric maniac now. That, that, that was an accident, I, I assure you. Um, so this was actually a, a really, really funny moment when Macron and um, Theresa May, I was running both their campaigns at the time, um, and they, they, they were, Brexit was going on and like no one had any idea what the hell is going on. And then they thought, ha, you know what? We'll lend you the bio tapestry and you can put it up in the British Museum. And I was like, what the hell is going on? Like you're arguing over like a 900 year old piece of cloth, like when you should be discussing more important things. And this is me as an archeologist saying that. But actually um, it shows symbolically how like culture, film, opera, radio, how all of these things are hugely important and they're technologies in and of themselves and they transfer really powerful messages. Like Goebbels, when he made radio very, very uh, cheap and available to everyone and then that meant that he could happily stream the content that he wanted into every single German household, that was a turning point when in his propaganda machine. Similarly, um, for example, Mozart, um, he hugely upset the um, Austrian emperor at the time because if you actually go to see Don Giovanni or marry of Figaro, um, it, there's a, at the end of Don Giovanni, they have this aria and it's like for liberty, for liberty. And he was a massive, um, like anti-statist basically. And uh, he was hugely unpopular due to that fact. And basically like he almost got kicked out of court for that reason. So all of these things that we now take for granted as a part of classical culture, they've always been technologies that have been used for a very, very um, specific point. Borders and transportation, um, again, like the notion of borders seems very natural to us, the notion of nation states. Um, again, like Italy that didn't get unified until 1888 under Vittorio Emanuele. You had the same with Germany that got unified under Bismarck. Austro-Hungary, -Hung what the hell was going on there doesn't even matter. Like, and what the hell happened after, like, we, we still had wars going on in the 90s of, like, 1990s as, as a direct result of that fact. Britain, they colonized a quarter of the globe to, like, great effect. Um, and, like, all these things have been hugely transient. And the notion of nation states has only really been around for about 150 years. What I actually have here, um, I, I did archaeological excavations in um, Botswana, and we were close to Pond Drift, and we came up to this bit here. And the reason it's got such a peculiar um, kind of like semicircle is because Cecil Rhodes, because this is Zimbabwe, Cecil Rhodes had a cannon here that had a 30 mile radius like this, and there was infected cattle in Botswana. And so they literally drew the um, border of the state that is still in effect, so that the infected cattle wouldn't go there because they'd be shelled the shit out of by um, Cecil Rhodes. So like all these things, they're literally someone taking a pencil and drawing on a map, something that we live our entire lives by which is a little crazy sometimes. So from Palantir to Brexit, my humble story. So Palantir, I started working there in 2014. We're building up um, from the HR perspective. That's, that's where I started because not many options for an archaeologist who wants to go into tech and change from month to month. Um, uh, we were recruiting like a thousand people for their London office. It was crazy. It was really intense. They were looking for a thousand unicorns, it's like, okay, good luck with that. That's, that's just not very scalable, but fine, fine. Um, and what was really interesting is that they gave this like cryptic image uh, and like I would call up people being like, do you want to work for Palantir? And they're like, no, you're the devil, never. Like I got that every day. 
But it was really interesting to see that basically the um, concept of this company was to make um, customized software for any problem that there is in the world. They wanted to solve all problems that there are in the world using software. What they were doing, in fact, is hugely sh shit and ineffective demos and gathering a lot of data and doing great PR while they were at it. Um, so the Palantir, um, the symbol itself, is the seeing stone from, uh, from Lord of the Rings, um, uh, the one that you know, uh, Saruman has that he like, holds his hand over, that's what they were insinuating. They're not um, public, uh, so they, they don't um, trade stock, so they're very, very cryptic. They had some funding from the CIA, i.e. a lot of funding from the CIA, but their PR image was much better than um, what they actually did. 90% um, of their income came from their financial products, um, and they were doing some things like um, programming drones to go against ISIS, um, and there were some like interesting projects going on. But um, it was really interesting, actually, more than their actual products, to observe the psychology of the company. And we see this with these huge technological giants like Google, Facebook, um, pa Palantir for that matter, that you almost get this state within a state developed. Like, the rituals that happened there, like Alex Karp, um, who was the CEO, and I think he still is the CEO, had this like inner circle and they all like drank whiskeys on Thursdays and like did Tai Chi. And it, it was like it was really peculiar and like they wouldn't share information like with the outer circle. And they were very proud of that, that they're like this segmented, like cryptic inner society. And um, it was just fascinating to see this new class of person almost emerge in society. Um, and that is something uh, that is just the image versus reality is like the the technological hype that is around us um, the, the fact that these companies are really taking over our minds uh, with the, the image that they kind of spread around themselves I think it's really important to bear in mind that a lot of this um, fear that, that's being installed in us there's, there's not necessarily always a real technological threat there's much more of a psychological threat that they seem like these cool problem solvers and actually they're just taking a shit ton of your data um, so this is something uh, important to bear in mind like the huge takeaway that there was from me um, from this experience. I then went into Nation Builder. Nation Builder, um, I had much more hands on. I was one of the people opening up the London office, so there was literally three of us. I held like 40, 50 different accounts. Um, as I said, both sides of Brexit, um, several American presidential campaigns, French presidential campaigns, some Albanian elections, which was crazy. I'll tell, tell you about that in a second. Um, well, I say elections, but you know. Um, <laughs> um, but the interesting thing about that is that the CEO, Jim Gilliam, who sadly passed away from cancer, his dream was to um, break up the bipartisan or the, the bi-party approach um, in America. He was fed up with the fact that you're either a Democrat or a Republican, and if you want to be in either, you have to spend an inordinate amount of money. Like You have to be really, really wealthy or have ridiculous connections from being wealthy to, to succeed. And what he basically said is that what you need is a CRM, so a database of contacts, you need some kind of communication tool, you need to be able to raise finances, and you need to be able to, um, uh, sorry, God, what was the, f oh yeah, um, have a website, sorry, I just forgot my own product that I like spent three years working on. <laughs> um, and the combination of these underneath one platform basically meant that anyone for like the price of like $20 a month can actually gather a really strong community about and, and run for office. So that was the idea. So it was like democratizing democracy, democratizing politics. Um, the interesting thing was that it was nonpartisan. So unless the, uh, it was criminal activity, we'd work with anyone. So I worked with extreme communists to like extreme fascists. It was fascinating. And it, it was the time that I decided I was done with politics forever because it, it was all absolutely the same. Um, but the thing, again, that like struck me most, it wasn't that they're these sinister entities, it was that they're absolutely useless. Absolutely useless. Like, I would come to the head of IT of a major party that had a database of like two and a half million, and they'd barely know how to use Excel. It, it, was, it was so bad. Um, the Democrats in the US, they have this ancient system called NGP Van, which is basically like this lobby system, and they have to use only that. It looks terrible. You can't connect anything to it. The API is pretty much non existent. And even the candidates are saying, look, you're not actually giving us the technological tools to succeed. I'm not even talking about like the levels of encryption or not, like lack of that, that happened there. Um, so again, like the threat, like the state, um, you know, we, we see it as like this, like, oh my God, this huge thing above us, but they're useless. They're absolutely useless. I didn't come across a single party where I'd think, wow, okay, you guys know what you're doing. It was holding their hands, having a call with them three times a week. Like I remember one unnamed French presidential candidate, they, they used to send, and I kid you not, 
five times a week to their entire database an email that long about what that candidate is going to be doing that week. Like, oh, he's going to have a baguette. It's like, who cares? Like, why are you not segmenting your data? Because like, there's a group of your voters that are interested in A and a group that's inter like, interested in B. You're not using that data at all. You're just like blasting your database. You don't care about like if your IP address is warm, like you've given up on that. You don't even know what an IP is. But um, it was just, it was just, really hard work. Um, and I think that actually scares me the most because we're not talking about AI anymore. We're talking about massive amounts of data being in the hands of people who are absolutely incompetent. And that's actually, I think, a huge threat. Um, so uh, oh, it, this was, I got to tell you about the um, Albanian election. So basically I flew to Albania um, and I came there um, and no, no one turned up. I was meant to train them up on the system. No one turned up until like noon. We we're meant to start at, like eight, but fine. Um, and then they turned up and like, they were like, they, they want vodka. I was like, no, no, no vodka. Like, please, let's just like do some work. Um, and the first thing that they did is that they sat down and they were like, we want the database of like the rival party. I was like, um, excuse me, <laughs> like, okay, no. And they're like, no, 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 we want the database. You don't understand how it works here. It's like, I don't care how it works here. I know how it works in international law and like data privacy. I'm not giving you a database. So they bungled me into Mercedes with blacked out windows, drove me into the Albanian mountains, poured me some red wine, gave me literally like half a sheep to eat. And they're like, you'll give us that database. I was like, look, you bribing me with roast sheep is not gonna make me give you your data. Like, just no, that's not gonna happen. So they tried for about four hours and then they're like, okay, she's not giving us the database. I was like, okay, like same time, same place tomorrow or like what's gonna happen? Um, but like, it was hilarious in that, that, for example, their canvassing or their campaigning was that they used to go door to door pretending that they're like a dog charity and they used to collect really sensitive information about the people. They bought everyone on the campaign trail a tablet. And they're all entering like their addresses, emails, social media, but they'd pretend they're like raising money for dogs. And it was just like, what? Like, how's this working? And, and again, you just realize that like, the state does not have its shit together. And like, I saw this all over the world. Um, and obviously there's details I can't go into because of an NDA, but like, it, it, trust me, like, they, 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 they don't know what they're doing. Um, and that brings me on to the myth of AI. So I think the biggest myth is that we've got strong AI or like artificial general intelligence. There's several people who claim they have it, like OpenAI, DeepMind. Um, there's several startups popping up that they're really close. We're not close because if we were close, if we already had it, that person would literally control the globe. That, that's, that's not happening. Um, again, they're, they're very advanced, very useful, fantastic statistical analytical models. But that whole like Cambridge Analytica spiel of they ran a secret algorithm on your data and now they're winning elections and you don't know how, Bullshit. No, that's, that's not how it works. And I'll get to that in a second. Again, the state is competently and cleverly using your data and feeding it into sophisticated algorithms. No, they've got unencrypted databases. Um, Pavel actually, like, you know, a few weeks back when the Slovakian Ministry of Health just left like 400,000 records lying there with people's diagnoses and emails and numbers, they're not competently using your data. They're just collecting it. Or people are not uh, educated enough about where their data is going and they're just sending it off to giants like Facebook and Google. And just by searching in Google, you're already leaving behind a massive. Um, digital um, map of who you are. And we're giving that data away like it was worthless. Um, think of it, if, if we had like a golden mine or a lithium mine, we wouldn't just give that away. Like we would have trade wars over that, but we're happy to basically send all of our data to like, um, for example, American servers, do whatever you want with it. NSA, yeah, sure, have my data, have my grandma's data, have everything. And we're not realizing that it's that incompetence in the middle where it's being lost and leaked and um, used in very, various ways. Um, also, elections are swayed by fake news and deep manipulation. They're not. Um, one thing that really makes me angry is that um, by the media especially, um, people are being portrayed as dumb and stupid. And they don't know what they're voting for. That's not true. I actually don't think that the voters are dumb sheep. Um, of, of course, in a way, hum humans are. But uh, this has been a rhetoric that's been really played up lately, and it's not the case. You cannot have an election won solely by the fact um, that you're going to like generate a sexy piece of uh, like fake news by an AI algorithm. First, even the GPT-3 model from OpenAI is not going to generate a piece of like fake news good enough for anyone to actually believe it at scale. But secondly, 
people are pissed off and they're, they're voting for an option that's going to shake things up. They don't necessarily believe in Trump or Brexit, but they're using that vote as a last resort of that, their absolute and utter frustration to be able to do something to the system. They don't actually care if it's bad. They just want to do something to the system because the status quo is really leaving them like dying. Um, cool. Oh, five minutes. Okay, that'll be interesting. I'll speed through it. Um, and finally, that artificial intelligence is a threat to democracy. No, artificial intelligence and technology in general, if used well, is the true democracy that we can have. Um, it's the uh, inability to work with data properly um, that is the real threat to democracy. Um, so the examples of AI um, in state purposes, um, we can see it in from everything like facial recognition and crime to um, things like data-driven populism, so actually making policies based on what you think people might like, um, the generation of fake news to a certain extent, predicting votes, that's what is being used for quite a lot of the time and often incredibly badly. Um, the thing that the states are worried about most is of course uh, cost reduction and the um, uh, replacing of bureaucracy. <laughs> AI because it makes things a lot more transparent. You can't hide things so much and also you don't need so much of the human workforce. So I think that that's where the current block is lying. Now Cambridge Analytica, the big AI hoax, they actually made a lot of money and a lot of good PR by pretending that they can analyze psychometric data, that they know exactly who you are, who you vote, how you vote. I've seen the algorithms, I've seen the technology, I've worked with some of it. I was not part of Cambridge Analytica, but obviously I was in that crew at the time. GDPR was coming in. And again, no, it was just Facebook sharing its data lazily. And it was someone saying, okay, I see a vague correlation between this demographic and them voting conservative or labor or like vote or leave. Um, so, sorry, vote, leave or remain. It wasn't anything sophisticated. It was like, it was pretty much linear regression and clustering. It wasn't anything great. But again, what that led to is, and I'm not going to read all of this because it'd make me throw up, but this guy called Lord Clement Jones, who's like 150, said, right, okay, Cambridge Analytica, bad news, everyone, AI is controlling the world, so we've got these regulations that we need to put in. And, I mean, the autonomous power to hurt, destroy, or deceive human beings should never be vested in artificial intelligence. What does that even mean? Like, artificial intelligence is not some robot sitting there twiddling his fingers thinking, oh yeah, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy these guys, I'm going to like sway the vote this way. No, it's just statistics. And like, these regulations are regulating something that doesn't even exist. And like, what that's then doing is completely stamping on the innovation on people like you who want to start companies, who want to innovate, who want to change the world. Um, and it's not allowing you to do that because the regulation is coming from a bunch of guys who've read something in a paper they don't really understand in any way. And boom, Bob's your uncle, suddenly you're not allowed to start a company and that's just crazy. So what should we do instead? Um, education, 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 exactly basically what is happening here at Paralanipolis. I don't want to go into it in too much depth because I don't have much time, but I think you get the gist of what I'm say saying. Um, the, the demand of this needs to go from the grassroots up. It needs to come from the kids and the average person in the street that we demand to be educated about latest trends, latest technology, and like what, is, what the hell is actually going on and what's happening with our data. So the vision of the future, I'm almost ending. <laughs> Um, so I think that the nation states are at an end. Um, I don't think that that's a, a model that can last much longer because the demands of the population of what the state needs to provide is vastly outgrowing what the state can actually provide back, mainly because the states have become so complicated and just so fatty. Um, there's going to be an increase in autonomous and independent groups. So I genuinely believe that Paralanipolis is a first step in the domino that's going to change the way society works. I think we're going to revert back to almost like tribal um, way of being, where we organize small groups based on beliefs and based on certain needs. And we're going to like start all over again, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, there's going to be a few high profile trials and hoaxes, so there's going to be like the Watergate of AI. Um, GDPR is such a fuzzy legislation that no one knows what the hell is going on. Again, I was there working in politics when it came into play and boy was that, like we were meant to give advice to our political clients about GDPR, like no one had any idea, like, like we didn't know. They were like, oh, do we have a two factor authentication? We're like, I mean, yeah, if you want to be on the safe side, but does it actually explicitly say anywhere? So it was really, really tough. And I think that there'll be a few um, politically driven trials to that effect. Um, and there's going to be a concrete breaking point because the, um, uh, the, the weights between society and the state and like the average person and the individual and the state is becoming really tense because of the technology that's making everything faster, more transparent, and that tension is going to break. 
Um, societies go through a, I mean, this can be disputed by certain academics, but go through cycles. I think that we're roughly here. We're not going to necessarily have a war or a bloody revolution, but we're going to have a political restructuring. Um, New World Order is maybe a bit too weird and Illuminati-esque, but um, uh, we're at that change. Um, the system that we live in now, I believe, is going to break. Um, and finally, um, we're going to be living as a dense network uh, in a much more globalized world. We're going to connect in communities and uh, the creation of communities that exist in something like, of like Parallel Nipolis is not something that the states are designed to deal with. And I think that that's going to be um, an increasing tension there as well. So thank you so much. And remember that you should dare to disrupt because the status quo that we're in is only imaginary. So thank you. Okay. 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 So thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Nice presentation. Very interesting. Uh, so I prepared some questions just in case we don't have enough from the audience. Uh, I haven't seen any in the chat. Uh, so in the room, uh, just raise your hand and uh, I. Okay. Cool. Do we have an extra one? Okay. Uh, what is your view on the like uh, Chinese Communist Party and their social credit score system? Are they just as technologically incompetent as uh, as Western politicians? It's it's a really uh, good point. I'm probably going to say something hugely um, un unpopular here, but I think that the uh, China versus the West rhetoric that's being blown up um, is. Um, I think there's a very deliberate purpose in which way that is being communicated in the media. Um, uh, on the other hand, atrocities like what is happening in Hong Kong is something that needs, needs to be dealt with. China, that, the problem is that they're um, almost eerily efficient and they've got a hold of that data, but no one else has. So what I'm advocating for is the data to be distributed in almost like an open source way and for the people to know exactly where it's going. Um, what's happening in China is that a huge amount of data is being collected, but it's going into one database that a very centralized group of people is um, basically monopolizing. So it's an equivalent of, um, I don't know, some, some guy coming and taking all of our mobile phones and putting them into a bank vault somewhere and like no one has any access to mobile phones. Like, it's hoarding of a very um, precious um, commodity. Um, so I think that the way that it's not decentralized and the fact that it's controlled is incredibly eerie. From a technological perspective, like if those were the nice guys, it's almost fascinating because like it can lead to things like predictive healthcare, right? Because like if they, if, if I go to the doctor and they can, for example, say, okay, like you're allergic to this t kind of stuff. You should have this type of diet. You should have this type of um, medicine. And it means that I live for 20 years longer. Great. I want them to have that data, but I want them to have that trust. I want to have that trust that they're dealing with it properly. But it all comes down to the fact that we can, I don't think that we can ever trust a state to deal with data in a, proper way, like because to assume that the state is going to be good is naive. So we need to come up with a way where um, data is being traded in like an, I think, almost open source, very transparent way. And I think that that's the only way forward. Um, otherwise, like we're always only a step away from uh, regimes like China. But also one last thing to think that Western countries are not doing similar atrocities with data like China is uh, also would be naive. OK, we have one more question over here. I, I hope that answered your question, by the way. Awesome. Is this on? It is. Good. So um, I really enjoyed your presentation, I, um, I should tell you. Thank you very uh, much. I would love to talk about capitalism, really, and the way it's basically eating itself. I would like to know if you're aware of the Jeremy Rifkin conference that went viral about the sharing economy. Do you, do you know like his work? Are you aware of like the the tracing basically about the transformation the big transformation in economics mm. starting if you go back like about 200 years or so with the uh, the first and the second revolution and the third one basically mm. uh where decentralization is supposedly key and in his if you if you look at his work it's it sounds like very utopic in a way like in an utopia even though he would argue actually that sharing economy it's sort of sort of like a a child of capitalism and having the technology, a good enough technology to produce go, um, goods and services at near zero marginal cost 
It's something that is already happening and it's supposedly allowing us to take back control of ourselves, mm. right? So the sharing economy, basically, and the possibilities of the near zero marginal cost society. Yeah. Oh, that's a fantastic question. And I, we need to chat after this um, because that, that I, I would bore everyone to death. But um, um, actually, like the notion of um, trading and reciprocity is like deeply, um, it's actually one of the things that makes us human. Um, so Marcel Moss, Moss in his um, book, Le Don, already spoke about, um, for example, at Christmas, you know, it, it seems like you buy, a, for example, a present for your grandma or your mom, but actually the amount of rituals around that and like the way that you can measure it through data, how much you spend on certain people and like what cards you send to everyone, it's a hugely ritualized process, and I think that can be extrapolated into a society in general. And we're seeing some of those trends, I think, in the um, so, um, uh, cryptocurrency space, um, where, where exactly th that kind of sentiment is being replicated. Um, and like, of course, like money and the value of money is completely fake. Like, I've lived in a lot of different countries, and like, even just the notion of an exchange rate, based on the fact that it's not based on the golden standard anymore, it's basically based on a fluctuating market that, in itself, is completely <laughs> artificial. Um, it, it's it's all i think a capitalism has basically become something for um people who believe that they believe in freedom to cling on to and they can't let go um and for example one of the big arguments that has been used in the uk where i lived which is where i have my experience from was the privatization of industry and railways during the margaret thatcher years and they were saying oh for example the railways they're privatized now yes capitalism but actually like in that specific case you've got two railway lines running down the country so that's not a market that's an oligopoly um and that's got nothing to do with capitalism but because we've become so tribalized and so obsessed with politics, the whole notion of rational and critical thought has completely gone out of the window. So everything's become really like Cartesian dualistic. And what I think that we need to encourage and what's going to help a shared economy, which I support, um, is just critical thought and being able to say like, look, I might be more right wing, but actually in this sense, nationalizing this makes a lot more sense. And that discourse is not happening at all right now. We're having people argue over face masks. You know, like it's, it's, it's crazy, like people will politicize anything and the environment's really toxic and I think that the transparency of technology can help kick off that much needed debate. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna be a bit selfish, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. Okay, so given uh, malicious or incompetent, incompetent organizations with tons of data, how does an autonomous group defend itself or uh, let's say, in an offensive or defensive way against those organizations? It's, well, and you'll find out during this Congress. <laughs> but, um, it's a really good question, and I think that there should be like a basic um, to-do list um, that everyone should learn from, like, primary school, like how to do your taxes and things like that, which is not taught in school at all. Uh, God knows how, I still don't know how to do them. Um, but what data even is, like where it's stored, like what a server is versus the cloud versus a hybrid system, um, how data is being transferred, what data, like what kind of like digital presence you leave online. Like when I, what I, when I remember how I behaved on Facebook when I was like 15, like I dread to think like w w what is out there, like some of my crazy comments or like even private messages to friends that I know that can be uh, spied on on any time. Um, so just like the demystification of data is not just something random that's like going to go to some nice guy over in a nice server in a nice like big Silicon Valley company to realize the huge threat and the huge value of it is only going to be achieved through education, public workshops, um, and but that we can't expect that of the state. So we need to do that ourselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Okay. On the subject of uh, demystifying data, I was at a conference a while ago and someone told the story of uh, during the German reunification, there was a debate whether the US intelligence agencies should continue to have a legal right to access all the telecommunications data in Germany, which they had uh, while Germany was split. Mm. And the German chancellor at the time didn't really have an opinion on this and was quite okay to have it continue uh, until some of his aides wheeled a large cart into his office stacked with thousands and thousands and thousands of sheets of paper. Uh, and he asked, uh, what is this? And they explained to him, these are all your telephone conversations that were recorded by the Stasi uh, which we just got uh, from the Stasi records office, which had been newly created at the time. And as soon as he saw that, he realized the importance of 
this data that he was about to sign over. Uh, and he decided that maybe we should not uh, continue letting everyone access our data because when he saw it concretely, what the implications were, uh, then he understood. Um, mm. Unfortunately, we don't have the liberty of doing this for everybody on the planet. Mm. Uh, so how can we concretize the importance of data to people uh, without simply showing them their records uh, from the NSA or whatever? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, uh, so I remember back back in Westminster, and that's a really excellent point, by the way. Um, and back back in Westminster, there used to be the culture of spin doctors, where they would uh, use various leaks. So w one of my friends actually now runs the um, entire campaign for for Boris Johnson and the whole like crisis COVID COVID response. Um, it's the company Topham Gurin, and like some of the stories that he tells me are just uh, are just insane. But actually, I think that the state is a great way to demonstrate that to show off uh, like. David Cameron's private text to someone, I actually think is a really good way to show, look, like they're incompetent, we can easily hack this. And if it can happen to David Cameron, it can happen to you. Um, I think that's a really like nice educational way without actually endangering uh, individual freedom of people who did not ask to be exposed in this way. Um, so the culture of leaking happens there a lot, but currently it's done by people who are not hugely technologically savvy. It's usually done when someone gets drunk somewhere, says something racist, they take a video of it and then they blackmail them over it. But I think that it's now it, turning, this culture is turning into um, actually hacking the other opponent's systems and leaking data. So I remember on the Vote Leave campaign, the day after the campaign finished, um, all the data went missing. Someone exported it. And like it, it's still, a, I, I believe it's still an ongoing um, thing. Um, it's got some kind of le legal repercussions. But to actually like write about that explicitly by some independent media that is not being controlled by one party or another, this technological watchdog, I think that should be there and they should every time in a very bombastic way, like Pavel did with the um, Ministry of Health in Slovakia to show, look, they left this data lying around. They left their private records lying around. And I think through this storytelling to show how incompetent the state is, you kill two birds with one stone. You show how incompetent they are with their own data and how incompetent they are with your data by proxy. And I think that would be a very um, helpful narrative. Okay, so that's uh, all the time we have for Q&A. Thank you again. And uh, so, Set up a like. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.